In Jeremiah chapter 18, if you have that, say amen. It's a privilege to have all these pastors and preachers, their wives, churches. Just God bless you tonight. And the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel. Somebody say, he made it again. As it seemed good to the potter to make it. Let's read verse 4 tonight in concert aloud, if you would. Let the devil know we're here. Verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make it. I want to preach tonight on the gospel of the second chance. Lift your hands and pray for us. Father, we love you. I pray here tonight that we would leave here different than we came. Somebody say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Jeremiah 18 and 4 states, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. It's very important you understand where the clay was at. The clay being marred is not the real issue. It is a major issue, but the thing that interests me the most is where the clay was. And so he made it again. I don't know. That's just good stuff all by itself. And probably could give the altar call now. But I have a few things that I need to say. Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 9 verse 21, Hath not the potter power over the clay? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. He does have the power over the clay. If there is a lesson taught tonight more than another Jeremiah's story of the potter and the wheel, I believe that it is the rightful and indisputable sovereignty of God over the life of everyone that's here in this, underneath this tent tonight. When once you get a glimpse or a picture of that potter and the wheel, you never forget it. Jeremiah could not forget it. The Apostle Paul could not forget it. And in the chapter, the ninth chapter of the book of Romans, he even told us that God, this great potter, has the power and the right over the clay to make it to become whatever he designs it to become. How often we hear the sinner claim that God is cruel, or if God is such a God of love, then why does God allow this to happen? Or why does God allow that to happen? Why did God ordain this and why did God ordain that as if God makes a vessel only to break it to pieces then we see those in the church that if they're not careful they struggle with the same questions now God doesn't create only to show his power to manipulate and destroy and this is not what I mean when I say that God is sovereign over his creation but what I'm trying to say tonight and I read a quote a man by the name of Bishop Quayle he said this and I liked it no potter ever lived who would fool away his time making cups to break. If a human potter knows too much to make a cup for the satisfaction of dashing it to pieces upon the floor, how much more shall the potter who makes the cup called human life know too much and have too much wisdom to break it? I hope you're with me tonight. Some here might say the analogy is, the analogy is not accurate, Pastor Lamb, because... Jeremiah's clay is dead. It has no will of its own to choose. The potter may do to it as he, as he wishes, and the clay cannot refuse or resist the, the, the potter's hand. And you may, you may reason with me and say, but I do. I have a will, and I can resist the hand of the potter, and I can, I can fight, and I, I don't have to yield to the hands of the potter. And I know that this is true. And so tonight we stand between two horns of uh, of an old uh, theological dilemma, uh, 
Are we free will moral agents tonight, or is the Calvinist view of predestination accurate? I mean, as a clay, do we have, uh, is God totally in, con in control over the clay? Or does, the, what the, does the, the, the manner in which the clay responds to the potter, is that what determines and what dictates what the clay becomes? And so they're very vital and very important questions tonight. Does God totally control us? Does God totally dictate the clay upon the wheel? Or does God give us a desire and a choice to do as we, as we want to? I see truth in both of these statements tonight. I don't mean to compromise. But I do believe that each and every one, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that's under the sound of the, my voice underneath this tent tonight, I believe you have a destiny. I believe that God has a perfect design for you that was laid out in the for, at the beginning of the foundations of the earth. But at the same time, we are presented with the dilemma that each of us have a will and we can alter that design and God is wanting upon us and we can change the course that God has laid out before us. And and so the sobering fact of it is we are creatures of free will and we become what we let the potter make us into. We cannot blame God for what we are. We cannot blame God for what happens in our life because God has plotted and planned the course so perfect that if we would only yield to His hands and yield to His plan, we would be exactly where He called us to be, exactly the, the exact right place and right time, and we would not have to worry about where we are tonight. I'd like for you to help me, but you don't have to. He already is. Amen. I would like to think that when Christ saved me, that I forfeited all my rights. I would like to think that. I would like to think that I am bound tonight by a contract that states that I must serve Him the rest of my life, yet the dilemma is still present because I could at any time void the contract by being careless with my soul. Brothers and sisters, what we become will be determined by our submission or lack of submission to the hands of the divine potter of heaven. So the sobering truth that we're going to have to understand is when it's all said and done, and usually there's more said than done, that is that you can't blame the preacher and that you can't blame your mama and you can't blame grandpa. And I don't care how many times you are mistreated by your uncle, you can't blame him neither. Because you're still going to have to make up your mind to let God be God. I wish you'd say amen tonight. Amen. It's because you are a free-willed moral agent. It is because you are free and that you can choose, and that you have been choosing for years, is the reason why I felt the Spirit prompt me to take you down to the potter's house and let you see how He works upon the wheel as He does what He does best. Sometimes I pray and I say, God, just do what You do best and be God in my life. If we would allow Him to be God, He would be God. And we would not have to worry about what's going on in our lives. My mind cannot help tonight but think and wonder upon the past. Upon that thing that happened in your life back yonder somewhere while the potter was busy with you upon the wheel. Listen to me. I'd like to preach if God will help me. I want to talk to you about that heartbreak, that disappointment, that letdown that you're having such a struggle for getting about. That thing that happened somewhere in the past that you come to that same place over and over and you feel like you got the victory and you shouted at revival. But as soon as the meeting was over, something came that same issue and you fought it again and you get into a place you're afraid to go back to the pastor because he's going to say it's the same thing over and over. But I didn't come to talk about the pastor tonight. I didn't come to talk about the pastor's wife. I came to talk about the clay's relationship unto the potter, a potter named Jesus Christ who knows all about it tonight. Amen. Jeremiah was pretty much discouraged over Israel. He is about to give up on them. 
and he thought that God had done everything in his power to help them. And he felt like Israel was at a place of hopelessness. Now the Bible lets us realize and see as we open the book and we read Jeremiah that he was at his wit's end. And as he got there, God told him, I want you to go down to the pottery. I want you to go down to the potter's house. And here he saw a potter busy at his wheel shaping a vessel. The wheel did not revolve as a modern day one would, a ran by a belt, a motorized contraption with electricity skimming off the building. But the potter worked the wheel with the pressure of the foot, the gradual application over and over and over. And as the wheel went round the vessel, the potter was shaping, arose gracefully beneath his practice touch. And just as it was apparently finished, and Jeremiah the prophet began to look upon the vessel, he was very pleasing to Jeremiah that something very strange happened. Exactly what happened, I cannot tell you, but the Bible says that the vessel was marred in the potter's hand. Now I can accept it very easily as I walk through the potter's field and see the discarded lumps of clay as I walk through a field that's of dirt and I see a a clay with mars in it and it blows my mind, saints of God, when I see the potter with clay in his hands and he's working upon the clay but yet the the, the, the clay is marred inside the potter's hands and so we see the potter does something very interesting with the clay. And I want you to watch tonight. It's so very important. I believe God will change somebody tonight. If you'll just get in here and help me a little while. I cannot tell you exactly what happened. Whether it broke and fell to pieces on the wheel or whether the potter examined it with his critical eye and saw some defect in its shape, we cannot tell. Oh, but the Bible does tell us that it was marred and the potter made it again. As somebody say, make me again, Jesus. Jeremiah thought to himself, the potter will reject this vessel. The potter will reject that crumbled clay. He will reject the imperfect face. But instead of rejecting the marred vessel, he stooped down and picked up the broken pieces and then crushed the disappointing vessel into a shapeless lump as it was before and putting it once more upon the wheel. He made it again. I said he made it again. When Jeremiah said it's over and Jeremiah said he's going to throw it out the window, the potter reached down and said, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Just because you're a mess, I'm not. Because you're messed up, I'm not. Because because you're at a dead end, I'm not. Because you messed the design up, I'm not. He said, I'm going to reach down. I'm going to pick the clay back up. And I'm going to put it back on the wheel. Amen. He could have cast it away. He could have threw it into the trash. He could have thrown it out through his little window into the potter's field. He could have allowed it to stand in its imperfect form. But he did not. He would not. He was satisfied only when he had put his best into it and brought out of the clay its highest possibilities. And this is exactly what the divine potter wants to do for your life and for my life in this service tonight. God has a plan, I believe, for every life. He alone understands the possibilities within us. And what he really wants is the best for each of us. The pity of it is is that the clay too often sets its wheel against the wheel of the one who turns the wheel to fashion it according to his own good pleasure. Now perhaps there's one here tonight suffering from disappointment. Perhaps your life is shaped in a way that you had hoped it never would. Has a path your own been littered with the wrecks of broken promises? Perhaps around the potter's wheel a lot of scattered fragments of broken dreams and torn up resolutions of shattered ideals that were yours in other days. And so you're here and you're discouraged and you're disappointed and you're heartbroken and you feel like there's no hope and you feel like you're in a place of helplessness and so you're on the potter's wheel that you're marred in his hands. You may feel that the struggle that you're in is almost hopeless and so you want to be a vessel of honor but you take one step forward and you push back too and so we see you. You're on the potter's wheel but you're marred even though you're in his hands and you say, for the Lamb, I go to church and I pay my tithe, but I'm struggling.
struggling with this issue. I'm having a hard time dealing. I'm in his hands, but I'm marred. Aren't you glad I'm not done preaching yet? Aren't you glad that the potter doesn't leave the clay laying on the ground? Would you help me, Holy Ghost? I've never talked to a potter about this matter. But I can think of three things in my own feeble thinking that could be wrong with a lump of clay that would cause it to be marred in the Master's hands. I believe there's going to be some of you here that's going to recognize at least one, maybe a couple of these. I pray for you. I pray for you. James 4 and 7 states, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. And so the writer instructs us to submit to the hands of the potter. I want to say this, the first reason that I would like to give tonight why the clay may be marred in the potter's hand is the clay may be too stiff. Stay with me. That too often the clay sets itself against the efforts of the potter and because of its resistance, it fails to take in the detail and the shape that the potter meant it to have and which would have made it a vessel fit for the king's palace. Now maybe this is the reason some of you are struggling so greatly. You have set your will against his will. Perhaps you have forgotten that the only peace that you're going to ever have is when you stand in God's perfect will and you yield to God's perfect plan in your life. If you aren't willing to yield your will to the will of God, to abandon yourself to Him without reserve to lie pliable in His hands, yours is going to be a marred and misshapen life that's going to come from off the wheel. Now I know of those that want God's will in their life, but they're not willing to do it God's way. And they want to, they want to take it their way. And they want to do it in what sort of fashion they desire. But sir, ma'am, you better hope that God overrides your eyes ideas. You better hope that God supersedes your theology and the way you want to do things because God knows exactly what's best in your life. And sometimes we pray for things that's not even God's will for us to have. And God loves us so much. He says, I can't give you that because if I give you that you can't have this. And when you get this, it's going to change your life. And so I pray that you'll yield your vessel under God tonight. Hallelujah. There are those that will never find peace until they apologize for some of the things that they've said about some of them around them. You're here tonight. I'm talking to you. I'm not down the road at the Baptist church or the, at the Presbyterian. I'm, I'm at the tent revival tonight. They spoke in this house, you're going to split hell wide open. If you don't make some apologies and get some things right, here's where I want to apply this. Because the Holy Ghost deals with our heart to make things right. God deals with our heart to lay things down. But we resist the potter. And we won't take the shape. And we won't take the form that God has designed in our life. And so we have become stiff. There are young men underneath us, underneath this tent, under the sound of my voice, that have been called to preach the gospel, but they will not yield to the potter. You've been, you, you give every excuse you can think of, but in the meantime, hell, it fills up tonight. There's young ladies in this house that ought to be on a mission field somewhere, are doing the work of God, but you won't go, you won't yield, and hell fills. There's preaching in the sound of my voice. Who wouldn't be my, come on now, say amen. Hallelujah. You ought to be much further than what you are. But you won't conform to the image that the potter has got for you. You will not pray. He moves you to pray. You won't pray. He moves you to fast. You won't fast. You won't knock a door. You won't do anything but God. And you're resisting the hands of the potter. Amen. Brothers, let us not be stiff-necked preachers that refuse to yield to the hands. Amen. Second thing that I'd like to present tonight is that the claim might have too little consistency. 
the mixture might be too dry and lack adhesiveness. Now in the first case, the vessel would not take form. But in the second case, it takes form easily. But it will not retain its form. I hope you understand me tonight. I know I'm a young preacher and say what you will. And I've been around long enough to know that too often men trifle with God's grace and goodness. Men make vows and resolutions are made, but they're made with what seems no intention to ever keep them. Men that are like Reuben, unstable as water. When Reuben should have received the greatest blessing from his father Jacob, I want you to hear the prophecy that was laid upon Reuben. Reuben, thou art my firstborn. Sounds good. My might and the beginning of my strength. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Pretty good. Say amen. Verse 4, unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel. Reuben had the ability, but he lacked the stability. I just come to preach to you tonight. didn't come to tickle your ears. Just going to preach a little while and go home. You see, you've got to shape up, my friend. God has spoken into your heart, but tomorrow you fall right back into the same place. You feel encouraged to pray tonight, but tomorrow you fall back into prayerlessness. And you're one of them that says it seems that every time I get ahead, the devil knocks me back. You see, you got conformed and you took shape, but you didn't hold the shape. And you fell right back to where you were. And so you spin your wheels and you've been years in the same place you're at right now. And you won't take shape. And you've been serving the Lord for years, but won't take shape. You ought to be teaching a Sunday school class. You ought to be pastoring a church somewhere. You ought to be on a mission field somewhere. But you just won't take shape. And nursing home ministries and prison ministries and all sorts of things that can be done in the house of God. But you just will not take form. The Holy Ghost moves on you. And you stand up and make great bows uh, and promises. But the next day you go right back to the same place that you was. Won't take form. It's a lack of consistency. It's a lack of adhesiveness. It's a lack of stability of soul that's causing some of you all your trouble. Third thing that I would like to present tonight is a clay may have a stone hidden in it. You see, the clay may have hidden in it somewhere a stone which would cause a blemish on the vessel. It could possibly cause it to break and crumble beneath the potter's hands. Hope you understand me. Is it possible that somewhere concealed away in your life, there's a stone, a secret hidden thing, some sin that has become part of your nature, and it is this that is marring and ruining your life. Now, probably in a size crowd like this, there's probably some young men or some older men that are struggling with internet pornography. Now, you listen to me. You think you're getting away with it, but you're not. You think you're getting away with it, but you're not. Because a man of God knows. The man of God sees. I couldn't tell you how many times I've walked into the house of God and a man walked in the back door and I'd have to slip over to the pastor after church and say, your man right there is dealing with pornography. And they say, how do you know? That's because God... God showed me. And so whether I know or not, God does know. And nothing goes undone. And you walk around, you can't get the victory. And you wonder why. And you may not do it every night. And you say it's not a problem. I don't care if you do it one time a year. It's a problem. And it will rob you of the victory. I know men that are full of anger. Full of bitterness because of a hidden stone. One cross word and they'll be at your throat in a heartbeat. Are you going to help me tonight? Though they're Christians, they're known all around as being mean-spirited 
and hateful. You know, so and so, yeah, he's mean. He's hateful. You know, so and so, yeah, she's she's mean spirited. And, and you know, that's just the that, that's just what you see. That's just the fruit of the matter. There's an issue inside the heart. And folk come to me and say, Well, I don't understand. Why are you not getting any closer? And then you can turn around and listen to them fuss and gripe and murmur and complain and get mad at people and talk and rumor and lie and gossip. You don't got to search anymore. You've got a stone in the vessel and it's causing it to be marred. Can you remember a time when your life was rising to a lovely shape? Fashioned by the thought and the will of the potter himself. But one day there came into your life that awful thing. That one thing. It's like a stone in the potter's clay. And work on the vessel as God will. He comes always to that one certain point, the flaw in the clay, that is thwarting the skill of his hand and concern of his heart. And he has to say, it's my heart again. He said, I'm not here to try to get any revivals tonight. I, whew, I preach enough as it is. And I could have probably talked Pastor Caraway into preaching tonight. But God spoke to me. And I don't know how you're going to take this. And you may not love Brother Lamb very much when we're done. But God wants to help somebody in this house tonight. Where is the fault? What is it? Possibly only you and the potter knows. Dear brothers and sisters, is that you? Is your life that you hoped would rise a beautiful vessel of marred and broken one tonight? Do you sometimes think the change will never come? Are you losing your desire? But you seemingly can't do anything about it. There's people listening to me right now, Brother Johnson, struggling so bad. They're only here by the skin of their teeth. It took everything they had to come to the house of God tonight. I didn't come to rebuke you. didn't come to rake you over the coals. And I've got a feeling there's some folk here desperate tonight. There's some young people in this house that are desperate tonight who came in here needing a touch of the Master's hand. Some folk in here that have tried to pray and it seems like your prayers are hitting the ceiling. And you keep going to church. You keep smiling. You keep going because daddy's a pastor or uncle's a pastor. You keep going because that's what everybody else is doing. But down inside you're dying. Down inside there's some things going wrong. And you're trying to get up here, but you just can't get your foot up. And it seems like you're at a dead end. And it's a hopeless situation. You don't got to say, man. You need to shake your head or wink at me. I know who I'm talking to. Because I know God has got your number tonight. But it's not a hopeless case. It's not a hopeless case. And I realize that some of us here tonight are marred in the potter's hand. Oh, but I bring you the story of the potter in the clay. Marred. And he made it again. Marred. And he made it again. I come to preach to you tonight. I come to preach the gospel of hope. The gospel of a second chance. The gospel of new beginnings. The gospel of starting over. Tonight can be the night. I draw the line. I step across and say from this day forward, I will never be the same again. I read a... I read a poem titled The Land of Beginning Again. The first verse goes something like this. I wish that there was some wonderful place called The Land of Beginning Again. Where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never put on again. Come on. Some of you are there. You hate yourself. You hate what you've become. And the devil don't make it any better. He got you on the run. Got you thinking that you ain't going to never get up. Got you thinking that you can't sing anymore. You can't testify anymore. 
He's got pastor's wives thinking that it's, it's not worth it anymore. He's got preachers in his house wondering, is it worth it anymore? Is, am I really in God's will? These young married couples here tonight saying, God, is it going to ever change? Is anything going to ever change for us? And we say, Lord, is there really a place of new beginnings? The brother Lamb knows of such a place. I read about it in the Word of God. The land of new beginnings. Would you like to know how to reach that place? If you do, you'll have to go by the way of the potter and the way of the wheel. It isn't always easy. But there is a possibility tonight for you to come down to an old-fashioned altar and lay it all on the line right there and say, God, I know I've messed up. God, I know I've not prayed like I needed to. God, I know I've not done like I needed to. But that was five seconds ago. And Brother Lamb said, I can start over. Brother Lamb preached to me the gospel of the second chance. He's a God of a turnaround. You can come in and get a turnaround tonight if you really want one. I was preaching on the streets of Richmond, Kentucky. We stood between two bars and right in front of another, seen scores and scores of souls get saved. Prostitutes, drug addicts, homosexuals, I could not name you the motley assortment of people that gave their lives to Christ right out there on them streets. I remember one distinct night, if God will give me a right mind, I'll never forget it, Pastor Carraway. A young man made his way across the street from a, from a bar across the road right there. And he had, I think, a, 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 a cup of soda and a thing of peanuts in his hand. I can remember so vividly. And he said, Preacher man, quote me some scriptures. And I tried John 3.16. He said, I know that. Romans 10 and 9, he knew the basics. I could tell the Holy Ghost was upon him. Conviction was heavy. He said, I'm a, I'm a hardline Presbyterian. He wanted me to know that he was Presbyterian, but he was conservative. And he'd been backslid a long time. He said, my family used to take me to church. He was, he was, a, he was a, a student at the University of Kentucky. And I saw him begin to talk to him, begin to minister to him. And he began to cry. And I said, Benjamin, would you go down and pray with me? He said, yes. So I took him down in the, down in the alleyway where our altar was there. Folk walking by. We began to pray with Benjamin Baggett. And I've never seen anybody sob so uncontrollably. His shirt began to soak with tears. And he just sat down in the, on the sidewalk and leaned against the brick wall. And he cried and he looked at me real suddenly with a, a glow on his face. He said, Preacher, I've tried everything. He said, I tried Buddhism. He said, it didn't work. He said, I tried voodoo. He said, I tried a Wicca, which is witchcraft. He said, I spent six months in Africa. I tried all those African religions. And with a glow on his face, face. He said, but nothing has ever made me feel like Jesus. I said he was marred, but he made it again. He was marred, but God made him again. Acts 12 and 25, I'd like to take you to the Divine Library tonight. Let us look in heaven's looking glass for just a moment. Acts 12 and 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. It's very interesting. We just were teaching the book of Acts. But you can't stop on chapter 12. You move on to chapter 13, verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John departed from them, returned. Turn to Jerusalem. I don't know what happened. But John said, I'm not going with you in the work anymore. Well, Saul and Barnabas coming down on another missionary journey. Barnabas said, Saul, I want to go get John Mark. In verse chapter 15, verse 37, 38. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them in Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And so now we see the man of God, the Apostle Paul, is saying, no, I'm not taking John Mark with me. John Mark doesn't have what it takes. John Mark isn't a man enough. He turned and walked out on us back there. I don't know what happened to John Mark, but John Mark lost hold. I don't know what happened to John Mark, 
But he lost grip on it. He was doing well. He was walking with the men of God. But something happened in his life that made John Mark turn around. And so we see a vessel that's in the potter's hand. But now we're seeing revealed to us that John Mark had a mar in his life. You say whatever you want to. You have heard it preached both ways. Paul's right. Barnum's right. I've been Paul. I just said, you stay, you tell him to stay home until he gets things right. I, the, the, the work of God is not to be trifled with. And so Paul took off. Now listen, I don't know how long the space passed, but Paul's locked down in a prison. He's getting ready to die. And he pulls out his pen. And he pulls out a piece of paper. And at the top of the, top of the letter, he says, Dear Timothy, I write to you the second time. And he tells him his problem in chapter 4, verse 11. He says, Timothy, only Luke is with me. But listen what he says to Luke. Uh, to, to, what he says to Timothy. He says, take Mark and bring him with thee. For he is profitable for me for the ministry. Did you hear what I said? I mean, somewhere between the point A and point B, the, the potter picked John Mark back up and said, I know you're a marred son, but I'm going to make you into another vessel. It's the gospel of the second chance. Who can forget about Samson, the God's strong man? The Spirit of God will move upon him, and he do a great feat, but then the world would pull him back down. The flesh would pull him back down. He was up, he was down. He was up, he was down. Sound familiar to you? Oh, hallelujah. We see him sinning with the Tim Knight woman. We see with the gaze I hearted and laid his head in, the, in Delilah's lap. Now we see his eyes plucked out and he's lost his power. And the Lord's left him and he's grinding at the meal. The Samson cried out, God, just one more time. Give me another chance. Give me a second chance. And God gave him his power back. And Samson did more damage in the end than he did in the beginning. You say it's hopeless with a lamb. It's too late. No, it's not. If he makes you another vessel, you'll slay more on the next go round than you did in the past. Hey, man. Can I, can I have about five more minutes here? Can I have five more minutes, preachers? Hey, man. How can we forget about Simon Peter? You will deny me three times. I don't know about you, but I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I feel like old-fashioned preaching tonight. You will deny me three times. No, not me. Yes, you will. Before the cock crow, you're going to deny me. Why did Peter say no? Why was Peter so vehement about not denying Christ? Because he was in his hands. And, and, and we think that when we're in his hands, we can never mess up. And if we mess up, that means we're not in his hands. The devil lies to you. That devil is a liar. Because you've got a mar doesn't mean you're not in his hands. Because the vessel can be marred. I'm not talking about gross sin. I'm not talking about just falling out and plumb sin. But you know exactly what I'm talking about. And there are times the enemy rocks your world and says if you were really saved, you wouldn't have just thought that. If you were really saved, you wouldn't have just said that. I'm not saying he was right. But don't you let the devil tell you you're not in the potter's hands. Because if he can get you out of the potter's hands, you'll never get changed. You'll never get rearranged. Just hold on to Jesus and come back down to the potter's house tonight. Simon Peter at the high priest hall, warming himself by the devil's fireplace three times. I don't know him. I don't know him. And he began to curse the third time. I've never heard of the man. Oh, the cock crowed. Luke tells us a little piece of the story. The first time I noticed it, I wept like a baby. The Bible said that Jesus and, Luke and Peter locked eyes. That Jesus looked at Peter. He didn't preach him a message with his mouth. But in his eyes, with those eyes of love, he told Peter, Peter, I'm giving you a gospel of a second chance. And Peter went to a field and wept bitterly. We find him gathered in the upper room there with those other disciples. And Mary made her way down 
And she said, Jesus came to me and told me to go tell his disciples. And Peter thought, not me. And then she said, and Peter, and Peter, don't you tell me that you can't get back up when you fall down. He'll lift up a righteous man seven times. You can get a turnaround in this service tonight. Amen. Holy Ghost, help us. Would you lift your hands tonight? I'm going to close. I desperately need somebody. Please come to the piano. I don't want anybody on this piano that needs a second chance tonight, though. Oh, come on, Sister Baggett. I don't want anybody on this music that needs a second chance tonight. I want to see you on the wheel tonight. You see, you understand. If God spoke to me anything, brother, concerning this service, this is what I need to tell you. The same hands that watered, caressed, molded, and gently stroked the clay was the same hands that crumbled and crushed the clay. He smashed it into an unrecognizable lump. And that's the way you are right now. Why, Brother Lamb? Why? Sweetheart, please pray for me. Why does God do that? The potter could have thrown you out. He could have thrown you into the trash. He could have threw you out that window. But even worse, he could leave you just like you are. But when I look in the mirror, my heart cries, God, change me. He could leave you just like you are. But this potter will not do that tonight. He loves you so much that he'll start over. He loves you so much that he will reach down on the floor and lift you up. He'll not be satisfied until he puts everything he's got into you. Until you come to your highest possibility. The potters of this world, they discard the marred. They discard the broken and the blemished. But the divine potter is different from the potters of this world. He'll go into the field and gather the broken fragments. Bring them back into his shop. And he smiles. He says, I know you're broken. But you're going to know the power of the potter when I get done with you. Would you stand with me across the house? Just for a moment, I want us to look away from the wheel and the clay. And I want to look on the shelf at the potter's house. On that shelf, there's beautiful vessels, vessels of honor, vessels of glory and usefulness. We look at men like Pastor Carraway and such a prince of a man, Brother Lot. There'll never be anybody talk about you in front of me. I'm, I'm just privileged to be on the same, on the same tent as a man like you. And I look at some of these men and I think to myself, I'll, I'll never be on that shelf. I've had some come to me, Brother Lamb, how did you do this? And we look at these beautiful vessels of honor, but they haven't always looked like this. One of the greatest men I know is Chester Green. I don't mean to burst, brother. What a, what a, what a man. And now you look up on the shelf and you think, man, he's... Brother Green ain't always been on the shelf. 
And I want to tell you this, and we're going to open up the altar. God help us. There was a man who had a pretty, pretty nice house. Had an exquisite china plate hanging on the wall that fell off and broke. And they just didn't have time to fix it, so they put it in a box and set it up in the closet. They were going to fix it, but you know how it is when you <laughs> seem to never get around to things. A year went by, two years, three years, and he did some spring cleaning and came across that broken china plate. And they said, you know what, we might as well just set it out on the curb. And they took that box and they set it out on the sidewalk. And the trash man was supposed to run, but the junk man came by. Real, real true junk man. He restores things that are junk. And he saw that china plate and he stuck it over the back of his truck, took it home, and he reglazed it, refired it. And when he got done, you couldn't even tell that it had ever been broken. He hung it up on his wall. Some time went by and that man that had the china plate in the beginning, he came over to this man's shop. He was looking for something and the old junk man said, let me take you in the house. He was inquisitive about the man's work. He said, let me take you in the house and show you my stuff. And he walked in. It was the most beautiful place you'd about ever been in. He said, you see that china cabinet there, exquisite, $2,000, $3,000 china cabinet. He said, oh, I picked that up. On the sidewalk, I re-sanded it, re-varnished it. You see them chairs there? Oh, yeah. Got them out of the junk, too. You see that kitchen table? His entire house. And this man was just blown away, and he was looking around on the walls. And he said, hey, you got my china plate. And the junk man said, oh, no. He said, you broke it. You put it out. He said, but I came by. And I fixed it. I glazed it. I refired it. That's mine right there. And I can't help but think, as I watch the devil come into God's house, and he looks up on the wall and sees Mary Magdalene, he says, she's mine. He said, oh no, you abused her. You tore her up and you discarded her. You filled her with spirits. And I came by and I cast the devils out and I healed her broken heart. She don't belong to you anymore. That's mine. That's mine. I can see the devil say, Hello, Paul, right there. He's my own. Oh, you cast him out. But I gave him a, ch- a second chance. Hey, say amen, church. The Holy Ghost is here to give somebody a new start tonight. Lift your hands and give God some glory. He'll put the pieces back together. I said he'll put the pieces of your life back together. Oh, I feel the sweet spirit of God here tonight. Before I open this altar, God spoke to me. There's at least one young man in this house that God has called to preach. But you have not accepted the call. Maybe more, but God spoke to me distinctly. And I need to give you just a moment here. A calling to preach in your life, but you will not accept it. You're pushing it off, pushing it off. Pushing it off. If that's you right now, Step out of those seats. Come down here in the front. We're going to lay hands on you. I'm not going to tarry long. I'm just giving you a shot. If that's you, I want you to step out of there. Come right here and let's pray for you. Amen. How many needs a second chance tonight? Well, I guess I'll have to ask you to bow your heads with me, right? Close your eyes. I guess that's. I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. Well, if you're embarrassed, let's bow our heads. But when I came tonight, I came even thinking that I might not even be in His hands. 
I came tonight thinking I've got a mar. There's no way that I can be in God's hands. But I come to debate you tonight. I come to argue with you, reason with your mind. He doesn't throw away the clay. You came here tonight needing a move of God. You can have it right here in this service. Please, I'd like to, I'm begging you, every head bowed. If that's you, I want you to quickly lift your hand and put it right back down. I need a second chance tonight, Brother Lamb. Lift your hand. Hands. Bless that hand, young lady. I see that hand. I see that hand. There's more. There's dozens of you here tonight. There's dozens of you here tonight that need a second chance. I want to pray for you. And I want to give you an opportunity to pray. Father, I humbly come before you tonight. I've done my very best. No one can touch us like you can. There was hands all across this building, Lord. Some wouldn't lift their hands. So, so downtrodden, they wouldn't even lift their hand. The devil has convinced some sinners in this house that they can't be saved. He's convinced some saints in this house that this is the way it's got to always be. But God, if that's true, I could have preached other things, but why did you tell me to preach this to them? It's because I'm a living example that I've fallen, I've, I've broken, I've been on the floor, but you always pick me up. And you're here to pick somebody else up tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I need to tear you from a moment more, oh God. Oh God. Come up here in this front and let us pray for you. You needing it so bad right now. Get up here right now in Jesus' name. Pastor Carol, we passed a lot. Would you get that anointing oil and get ready? Come on. Come on. Tonight's your night. Tonight's your night. There's others. God bless this strong, strong woman right here. It takes guts. It takes guts to step out like that. There's others in this house. I need a second chance tonight. In the mighty name, some of you need one. 